This is going to be actually following up on the other talks very closely. Um, I have had the benefit of wonderful translation from Portuguese to English. I understand you don't have translation to, from English to Portuguese. So wave if I'm going too quickly and I'll slow down. With this timing and with me, I tend to go too quickly. Now the published title of this was The Future We Want because that was an early working title. But in fact, the next session this afternoon is about the future. This is really a session called Health and Wellness. Health and so I'm really talking about health and comfort. I'll give some background just about me. I started as an architect. I wasn't very good. Most of my buildings have been like this one, demolished. I then became a real estate developer and did a couple of buildings, but I got out of that because I thought the market was going to crash. The market has kept going. I then got into prefabricated housing and started writing about prefabricated housing to promote it and found out I liked writing better than I liked trying to sell prefabricated housing, which is how I ended up here. And I met Elrond Burrell through Twitter going back and forth and this tweet was an important one for this discussion because I was complaining that Passive House just talks about energy and it's not enough, it's not enough. We have to think about embodied energy and materials. We have to think about where people live. So, you know, I said, we've got to think about more about air quality and about the kind of things. We have to think about embodied energy, the materials that go into our buildings. We have to think about where people live and how much gasoline we're using. And I put this all together after the discussion with Elrond and came up with, as you saw on his presentation, the Elrond Standard that I called <coughs> after him. Dr. Feist, who follows me on Twitter, evidently, was not impressed and said, no, we have to concentrate on energy. No chance to meet our goals if you go off in all of these other directions. But I disagree because people don't really care about energy the way we think they do. When you ask people in surveys what's the most important thing to them, they talk about to save money. But then when you look at Passive House, we know they don't save money with the price of energy. Then they want more comfortable second, protecting the environment way down there. Last but not least, quality of life. So for future generations, people are fundamentally, I think, selfish. And I'll get into that. I've also shown this slide you saw in the last presentation. But what I want to do is talk about another certification system that's very popular in the States right now that's, I believe, coming to Europe, as I mentioned, and it's the well system. Now, the well system doesn't talk about energy at all. It talks about health. And it was founded by a guy from Goldman Sachs, and it's now run by Rick Fedrizi, who built lead into the powerhouse it is. And four years when it started, I thought it was really phony pseudoscience, you know, little better than goop. Uh, and I thought this is really dumb. It had aromatherapy shower heads and all kinds of weird stuff. But they learned fast. They learned that the real people really care about health and comfort and that the real role of a building is to keep us healthy, happy, safe and comfortable. Now, look at what, well, this is very simple, similar to, I think, Fernando talked about this morning with the nine items that came out of New York. Well looks at these seven items, air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, and mind. And it's taking off like a rocket. It's gaining momentum in Europe. In four years, there are 6,500 certified well people, 1,000 projects. You know, when it comes to any other standard, they're stealing our lunch. They're just basically taking over. They've expanded into residential and community standard. They're getting into real estate, a 134 billion global industry. We can talk about energy and we can talk the way we do, but if we're going to have a role in the market, we have to look at what do people really want. And they evidently really want these things that Well is selling. Now, fortunately, as been said this morning when we looked at this, Passive House covers most of these. It really does a good job, particularly air quality is one really important point. 
And I looked, and even Lisbon, with I understand the ocean air, still occasionally gets up into spots that is dangerous. I have to apologize. All the text, when I convert from keynote to PowerPoint, I forgot. It all disappears onto one line. So anything that I've got that's text, we'll just ignore. That's what's happening here. But you can see, everybody cares about this. You look at the papers. People are moving out of London. Uh, particles uh, are found in mother's placentas. Air pollution is cutting two years off the lives. And this all addresses that, should you have a fireplace in your house. It may be cultural, but the answer is really no, and I'll get into that. And I used to believe in all the old techniques that grandma's house had, the big windows that opened the cross ventilation. And I realized they just don't work in this modern age when the outside air is so polluted and we're so concerned about that. The passive house really deals well with these issues, with these wonderful air filters and air cleaning technology that you've got. So you're great in outdoor air quality, but there's nothing in it that I can see that once you get in there talks about indoor air quality, the stuff that we bring in, the materials that we use, the surfaces that can collect mold and bacteria, the formaldehyde that is emitted, the type of stuff that we bring in like the 60s ad, you shouldn't have to wear a space suit to wash your house because of the chemicals. And then people also bring in for their own use all kinds of other chemicals that wreck the indoor environment. Uh, you look in some medicine cabinets and they're disaster areas of chemicals and toxicity. So one thing that the well does is that they go back a year later and they check. Are people living up to the standard that they agreed to? Are they having all of this stuff when you look under the kitchen sink that's totally toxic? Another thing that well looks at that I think that any designer of a healthy home has to think of is water. And I talked about this in my video last year. That when you look at why Le Corbusier put a sink in the entry hall of the uh, Villa Savoie, it wasn't architectural, it wasn't that, it's that his client was a doctor and doctors at the time knew about bacteria and disease transmission and they didn't have antibiotics. And so the first thing you wanted to do when you got into your house is you wash your hands. And they'd learned about germ theory, but they couldn't deal with it. And this is where modernism came from, the whole idea of natural light. This is why the Villa Savoie was built in stilts to get it away from the ground, because this doctor thought the ground was where bacteria came from. This is why when you go into the, the uh, Maison de Verre, which was designed for another doctor, every surface is rubber and washable and cleanable. You could go into the stairway in the Maison de Verre and you could actually lift each of these stair treads out and go wash them in a special sink because he was so concerned about bacteria being tracked in. Uh, the reason they built these wonderful chairs that we all love now, the modernist chairs, is, this is the beginning of the quote I can't read you, that they were easy to move, to vacuum under, there was no soft upholstery to gather bacteria and dust. It was all about bacteria, bacteria, and cleanliness. It wasn't about modernism. And now we're facing this again with the antibiotic apocalypse. So we have to start thinking again about how we design everything in terms of, is it cleanable? Modernism did not develop as a style. It, it was developed as a way of keeping clean. That's why I love this passive house so much. It's up on stilts. Pretty soon we all may, might be building like this. And, you know, we might be, I don't know about this, but the fact of the matter is that it's something that we're not thinking about. Nourishment is one, uh, this is a thing that I'm really going to get into a bit about air quality. I'm going to skip my first two slides about the American fridge and how people eat and skip this one and this one and go right into this. this. This house didn't quite make passive house, but it's got a stove there in the middle of the room with no exhaust hood. It's lovely to look at, but where does it all go when you cook? And when we do get hooked, hoods, they're often totally useless. They're too far away, or like the recirculating hood that everybody uses in passive houses because of the air quality problems of the balancing of the air, but it's the most screwed up, badly designed, inappropriately used appliance in the house. And if you were at Munich, 
for the Passive House Conference in the spring, you learned how useless they are, that they take almost nothing out of the air, that it's like an hour later and there's still particulates going around. This is one of the reasons that in the 30s, the really avant-garde and important kitchen designers made kitchens as little rooms that were separate. They didn't want people living in the kitchen. The kitchen was the place that you went away and cooked. Or in China, where they cook in a way that it flames up really quickly and there's a lot of smoke in that. They want the Western look of the open kitchen, but they know they can't have one because the whole place would be because of the air quality problems. So all their beautiful open kitchens in the high-end Chinese apartments are all enclosed like in glass like this. Now, do we have to start thinking like that if we're going to start a worry about air quality inside a passive house? I think we have to take it into account. I was in this gorgeous passive house townhouse in Brooklyn where the owner was a committed chef and said I had to have this giant six burner gas stove. And the architect standing there, I mean, I think he spent more money on this whole kitchen ventilation system than I've spent in my entire house renovation. It's hugely expensive. I'm not convinced it actually works. And you see things like this. This isn't a passive house, but there's just no way that that hood is going to do anything. And this recent research that's from Shelley Miller uh, in Boulder, Colorado, that just studied all of this, that if you've got lousy hoods and if you've got gas stoves, which so many houses do, you just have terrible problems of asthma, bronchitis, everything else that are really serious. And I can't imagine that it's not worse in a passive house. So we have to get away from gas. All, notwithstanding all of the marketing, gas is a serious problem. Uh, I think open fireplaces are too. And we have to start thinking about decarbonizing and going electric with everything. Light is another thing the, um, the well people go into, and I'm not going to spend much time on it. Light, I think, is often a real problem in Passive House because, of course, you have to control the size of the windows. Passive House windows are very expensive, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because I didn't have time to put that together. Movement is another thing. In the slides this morning, there was all the talk about taking your passive house and putting solar panels on the roof and connecting it to an electric car. Well, this is the this falls into the smart house stuff that was talking about earlier. Last year, I also presented that I like dumb houses. I like. Uh, a house that just because of the insulation and the design takes care of itself. A smart thermostat and small installed in a dumb passive house is going to be bored stupid because it has nothing to do. The temperature is always stable. And I don't think much about the future of electric cars either because we just don't have the time and they're just as bad on the roads as any normal car. And I think we have to think about where our passive houses are put. We have to be part of cities. We have to be building walkable communities. We have to design for uh, bicycle infrastructure that passive houses have to, if they think about transportation, about where they are, it's critical. Because all of these Tesla Model 3s are still creating the traffic jams. They still need the highways. It doesn't fundamentally change the picture and it takes a lot of energy to make them. Obviously, thermal comfort is where the passive house. I forgot to put on my timer. Where are we? Oh, thank you. Um, this is where you absolutely shine. I mean, comfort. Uh, the, you know, what do they do in America for comfort? You buy this stuff. Uh, people are wearing sleeping bags and their sofas. But as Elrond said, the three most important things are comfort, comfort, and comfort, which you deliver. This is where I'm supposed to talk about the smart thermostat being bored stupid. It wouldn't have anything to do in that milieu. And we used to think when I went to school that comfort was very simple, a combination of humidity, air movement, and temperature. But it's not. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, Robert Bean on this wonderful website, Healthy Heating, talks about all the psychological things that go into making you comfortable. And they're not just those three. It's also personal parameters, how much activity you're doing, what you're wearing, and how you feel. 
So all of these psychological things go into it. But the most important one is the mean radiant temperature. How quickly is your body gaining heat from the wall or losing heat from the wall? You can have the temperature set perfectly at 20, and you'll still be freezing if the wall isn't insulated. And passive houses are perfect for that. The wall is as warm as you are inside. Last night, I saw something I'd never seen in my life yet, which was condens condensation on the outside of a window. Where where I am, it's always cold, and the condensation in a crappy house goes in the inside of the window if you have bad windows. Here, everything was condensing outside when it got cold at night, and the outside of the window in the passive house I was in was as cold as the wall, as cold as everything else, and it was condensing, water was condensing on the outside, which to me is extraordinary that the window quality is so good that the outside surface of it is the same temperature as the outdoors and the inside surface is the same temperature as the indoors. This is comfort. The other thing that is so wonderful about the passive house, again, is the sound. This is another thing that they worry about at the well. And sound is becoming a huge problem and here's one where they're saying it actually kills thousands of people per year. The sound from highways in almost every city is insanity. I was in a passive house in Brooklyn, though, this one when I was on a tour, and there was a bus and a transport truck passing out front at high speed, and you couldn't hear it at all. This was the quietest apartment in New York. I slept last night in the passive house, and these are the windows that had this extraordinary uh, condensation on them. So, this, to me, is another selling point that we've you've got to just stress, you know, what is so special about Passive House? This is something where I think Passive House has to change and has to learn, and that is getting serious about what materials they are made out of. When I became an architect, in fact, because I fell in love with this totally fabulous plastic house at Disney World. Just thought the Mount Santo house from the future, you know, it just sat there, it was beautiful. The plan was terrific, a balance of beauty and function. Just astonished me, I loved it. And everything inside was like that picture, you could watch it and it was comfortable and it was all plastic. And they're still at it. This is at a Green Build conference. They're out there selling vinyl, the material of life, when in fact it's the material of death. Uh, just making it, the chlorine is the major importer of asbestos to the United States because of the process. It's essentially a solid fossil fuel. You take ethylene and you mix it with chlorine and you get plastic. And so when you buy plastic, you're buying fossil fuels. And they predict now that making plastic will be 30% of the fossil fuel business in 10 years as people get more and more electric cars. To make them soft, they fill them with phthalates and other chemicals, and then you let your kids play on these vinyl floors. And a lot of passive houses are built out of insulated concrete forms that are made with foamed plastic. They're insulated underneath with foamed plastic. I hope none of the foam sponsors out there are in the room, I'm sorry. Um, and you, know, and you fill them with concrete, two of the most carbon intensive materials you can get, a polystyrene and concrete sandwich, are they crazy? And everybody says, well, it doesn't matter because it's really energy efficient. And they always point to this thing, if we build out of that, look at all the energy we'll save. But in fact, if you go over time, when the operating energy gets really low, uh, then it takes a long time to pay off that debt. And I'll very briefly, I could spend all day talking about these slides, a recent study done uh, in Ontario where uh, a, a, an engineer looked at what happens if you build according to our regular crummy building code that doesn't uh, have a very high um, resistance at all in the walls. And you can see the red pyramid is over up to 2050, the energy burned actually keeping the place warm. And the orange is the embodied energy of the insulation if you used polyurethane foam insulation. If you go below and you build a high energy build, we can cut the red way, way down, but the impact of the embodied, the embodied carbon in the polyurethane is so high that by 2050, that building is still using overall, producing more carbon than the regular building code building. If you build the, like the next one with natural materials 
and then you have a high performance building, you, you, you produce almost no carbon. So it's one thing for everyone to say, oh, the passive house building doesn't produce much carbon, but if you make it out of these kinds of insulations, look at the problem you've got. I'll skip that one. And the thing you really want to do is go with really high efficiency heating, high efficiency building, and low carbon materials. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be here in Portugal, because what's the lowest carbon, best material on the entire thing? Cork. It's right up there as being the perfect insulation. And the worst are all these foams down at the bottom. That's why this is my favorite building, which is done by Archetype, where L. Ron Burrell used to work, which is a school in, in the UK that's built almost entirely of natural materials. You know, the basic structure is wood, the interiors are cork and other materials like that. The exterior is actually traditional thatch. I suspect that you could take the building materials that this thing's made of, chop them up, pour milk on them and eat them for breakfast and have a high fiber diet. It's just like totally wonderfully healthy materials and natural with an embodied carbon of almost zero. That's why, of course, there's a whole other story about why we're switching from concrete to wood. And, of course, why I love cork so much. Because I, you, it's just it's a natural material, it's a renewable material, it's a fabulous insulation, and it's healthy, it's antibacterial. And just so you know, it's catching on. This is a giant wall of cork at a, a building supply, a green building supply in Olympia, Washington, on the west coast of the USA, just stacking up, waiting for people to buy your fabulous cork. Five? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. This is great. I'm bombing through here. The other thing also, again, that they talk about that I think we have to consider is community. It's wonderful to build a passive house in the woods like Andrew Mitchler did this one. But when I was in Munich, I saw a whole community of passive houses that were all, uh, every, that this was the standard that they built from and that this is where we have to go to build these. Uh, we have to think of ourselves. We're not single family houses, but we're multifamily. We're part of a community. It should be part of our thinking. And the last category is mind. And the mind category in the, in the um, well standard is the hardest one to get your head around. But, and you know, I think, well, what are they talking about? What are the things that are important in our mind? And you look at their list, and what I come down with is beauty. This is the most important one. And beauty, I must say, sometimes is lacking in passive houses, where people are more concerned about the data than the design. And it's a problem. There's a certain kind of architect that's really into spreadsheets. So this is what you've got. But there are some very beautiful ones. And this is something that we have to consider every moment. I'll actually end with, I think, the most beautiful passive house I've seen in a long time. And I'll be hearing more about this afternoon. So Le Corbusier stole a line, and he stole it from Picasso, which was, he said, uh, good architects borrow, but great architects steal. And it's one of these cases where I think we have to look beyond just the passive house standard as we have it and steal some of these ideas because they're incredibly popular. And they're, we're really going to be a problem if we just stay in our niche. And even if it's not part of the standard, I believe every architect and every designer working in passive house should be looking at these checklists that they do and following them. Thank you very much.